Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for being here on this Antarctic morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. M my wife grew up in Seattle, uh, and uh, as you can tell, I did not. Uh, my wife grew up in Seattle, and we didn't meet in Seattle, but we're always planning to move back to the West Coast to be with family and so on. And 20 years ago, we very seriously considered moving to Bellingham. We had been living in Madison, Wisconsin, and we thought, well, we can't stand the climate here, but we like everything else about Madison. Where can we find somewhere on the West Coast that's a really nice small town, similar, and so on and so on. And we, we took moving to Bellingham very seriously. Then a job came up in Seattle, and my wife's parents were in Seattle, and so we ended up in, in Seattle. But anyway, it's very nice to be back here and in this, in this beautiful space. So, no. It's probably that I'm too close to this, so I'll start wondering about, which is what I do, and in that case, you should be able to hear me without any of that feedback. This morning, I'm going to tell you a story uh, which is quite a famous story, and a story within a story that isn't so famous, and that's essentially the structure of my book, Emperors of the Ice. It's a, a famous story that you'll undoubtedly know of, at least, which is sort of bracketed around, bracketed around a story that... Uh, was lost, essentially. And part of the reason I wanted to tell the story that was lost, which is really the core of my book, is because it sheds, I think, new light on the famous story and perhaps changes our perception of that famous story. And then the third story, which is related to those two, is the story of what happened to those two stories. Both these stories have come from, from 1911, approximately, and, and, the, and they have a strange history since, which tells us, I think, interesting things about quite large issues about our society as a whole, and that will bring me in a minute to um, the one slide I have for which I have to apologize for the quality. This is a very poor quality slide, and I have a very good excuse for that, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, but a couple of preliminaries. Well, the first preliminary is a purely practical one. I had this idea that I would come up here this morning, uh, questions and answers, sign my book for anybody who's interested in, in that, um, answer questions, and then spend the afternoon at the exhibit. Well, unfortunately, my brother-in-law, very, very inconsiderately, decided to get married this afternoon in Anacortes. So I have to leave fairly soon after I finish talking. There will be time for Q&A, and also I've got a few books, not very many, because the Postal Service managed to not deliver the <laughs> ones that I was planning to bring up here, but I do have a few, and, and we can do all that. Um, oh, and uh, when I, whenever I do a signing, I usually put, I didn't put it up, I usually put this sign up. What I tend to find is that when any authors do book signings, people are terrified of coming up to say anything or ask a question afterwards or just say hello because they think they'll get the evil eye if they don't actually buy a book. So I always put this up, real live author will answer questions, does not bite. Uh, and, and in any case... I'm going to just pass these around. You get a free bookmark, and if you want to come up afterwards, I'll sign the bookmark for you. How about that? So if you could just put, do me the favor of passing those around. Do take two if you feel like it. It's a wonderful piece of technology. It doesn't work for, excuse me, it doesn't work for those of you with e-books, but if you have the old, if the old fashioned kind of book, you can just, you, you just open them up and you pop this in and it's there. And, and it's great too, because every time you open whatever other book you're reading, it'll remind you that what you really should have done is bought half a dozen copies of this for all your friends for, 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 for the holidays. It does make an absolutely perfect holiday gift, and I'm not at all biased in saying that. Uh, and if you go to my website, which is on there, there is instructions even on how I can get signed copies to you. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? No other, no other holiday shopping necessary. So let me read a list to you and ask you to think a minute about what these people have in common. Mother Teresa... Am I still on? Yes. Mother Teresa, Harry, Ron, and Hermione from the... Um, uh, from the... Um, J.K. Rowling's books, Mahatma Gandhi, Batman, Abraham Lincoln, the abolitionist John Brown, Lenin, any movie character played by Bruce Willis, <laughs> Oscar Schindler, Frodo Baggins, Hercules, Perseus, and Achilles, Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games, Harriet Tubman, Zorro, To somebody, at some point, they've all been heroes. Of course, some of those people have been far different from heroes to, to some people too. But those people have all been heroes to some people at some time. And the sheer diversity of that list is just a reminder that we live in a society that is 
saturated with this desire for heroes and the stories of heroes. Just about everywhere you go, movies, television, literature, history, you find stories of heroes in some form or another. Uh, and, of course, we get to this idea of heroes through, in our culture, principally Greek, not only Greek, but principally Greek ideas about heroes. And, of course, the, for the Greeks, a hero was a very specific thing. A hero was somebody who was literally half human and half divine. I came across a particularly good example of this, and here's my really bad slide. Uh, not that long ago, when I happened to have a 15-hour layover in Reykjavik on my way to London, and I had just enough time to take a bus into Reykjavik, go to two museums, and get the bus back again to the airport. I'm so glad I did. There's some wonderful museums in Reykjavik. And at one of them, I found myself standing in front of this. And quite nearby, there was a nice big signpost saying, in Icelandic and English, no photographs. <laughs> But I had my cell phone on me. The light was very, very low because this is a building, a basement building in which there are some famous old manuscripts, very low lighting. And um, on the wall was a piece of stone held up on the wall with iron clamps about this size. And this is a detail from it. It was found quite recently in Sweden and then taken back to Iceland where it came from. It's 12th century, so it's almost 1,000 years old. And it shows... Am I working? No. Ah, it shows the god Thor in a famous myth. Thor was called by the people of a certain village because at Midgard because they were being terrorized by a serpent out of the, out of the field or the lake. And they, took, they asked Thor to come and protect them from the serpent. So Thor came along and took out his boat into the lake and used, according to various different versions of the legend, an entire sheep or an entire sheep's head as a bit of bait to catch the, to, to, to um, bait and then catch the serpent. And Thor, being a god and, you know, big biceps and everything, managed to capture the serpent. But the struggle with the serpent, the Midgard serpent, was so mighty, so titanic, that in the process of pulling the Midgard serpent up into his boat in order to kill it, he put his foot through the bottom of the boat. I, I just loved this detail because it seemed to so... It seemed to so characterize this dual nature of Thor, that he was a, had godlike strength, and yet he was the kind of guy who went out fishing and put his foot through the bottom of his boat. <laughs> um, and this little foot there, carved into the stone in the 12th century, was just a wonderful detail. So anyway, a good example of a hero. Uh, the, as I was saying, the, the, the heroes that are perhaps most at the root of our culture of heroes are the Greeks, Hercules, one of the many sons of Zeus by, a, by a, um, a mortal, Perseus. This is a wonderful Italian sculpture, actually rather gruesome. You can see the naked body of the dead Gorgon underneath, or what remains of her body after he's hacked the head off. And um, uh, most famously of all, of all the Greek heroes, of course, oh, oh sorry, Odysseus, um, another one, most famously of all, Brad Pitt. <laughs> uh, actually, not Brad Pitt. Your trivia question for the morning, who is Brad Pitt here? Achilles. Yes, well done. <laughs> so, what's striking about all these heroes, and we, I think in some of our kind of movie, TV heroism, we tend to simplify things rather. There are goodies and baddies, but what's interesting about all these heroes is they're, for the most part, unbelievably strong, fantastically persistent in the face of adversity, self-sacrificing, etc., etc. But they're not nice people. They're actually mostly psychologically pretty weird at the best. They're, they're Achilles. I mean, if anybody is familiar with the, uh, with the Iliad, in which Achilles is really the main character, the Iliad is a 10,000-line poem about the most famous snit in history. Uh, Achilles has had his... Uh, has had his pride wounded, and Achilles' pride is the size of a planet. And when Achilles' pride is wounded, it's really bad news. And really, the whole of the Iliad is about what happens when somebody with an ego bigger than you ever imagined gets in a bad mood. So these people are psychologically complex. They're, they're not likable people on the whole, or at least they have a, a very clear light side and dark side. 
I found myself thinking about this as I was growing up, partly because someone who definitely wasn't a demigod um, was in a way the, the person you would first think of if you were English and growing up in the 1960s and somebody said to you, give me an example of a hero. This man, Robert Falcon Scott, naval officer, there he is in his official naval, naval portrait with all that Victorian stuff on the, on the shoulders. Um, here he is in Antarctica. And uh, this man, to my grandparents and parents' generation, was, was the ultimate example of a modern hero. He was somebody who was who not only was a brilliant leader of men in difficult circumstances, but he was also someone who died a hero's death and icing on the cake, so to speak, as he lay dying, wrote some of the most moving um, language ever written about the nature of sacrifice and the nature of, of what he was doing. Uh, and so he was like a movie hero, only better and real. And that's kind of the... The, uh, the picture that I, I grew up with of this man. And it was therefore disturbing to me as I continued to grow up in the 1970s, 1980s, to find public perception of his value as an individual changing suddenly and very radically. And I'll talk more about that as we go on, but let's tell a bit about Scott's story. This is, his story is in a sense the famous story I mentioned, the bracket around which my, my book operates, and that is, what has come down to us as the race to the pole. So, anybody guess what this is? <laughs> well done, it's a map. <laughs> Oops. This is the South Pole. And this roughly is what Antarctica looked like in about 1900. I, I put this together myself just from, from other maps. It's just my sort of sketch of what was known. This is the Palmer Peninsula. This is the point in Antarctica closest to South America and also furthest from the pole. Uh, and these blue spots represent everything that had been investigated, seen, or mapped in about 1900. Uh, we'll be looking much more closely at this area down here in a minute. But so you're, you're at a point where nobody had a clue whether Antarctica was a continent, a frozen sea, a set of islands, what? Various people from Britain, um, Russia, France, and other countries had done these little, you know, investigated the edges, done a little bit of mapping, but that's as far as they got. People were talking about getting to the South Pole, but that was a distant objective at that point. And when the Royal Geographical Society decided to have an expedition to Antarctica in 1903, they said, and this quote illustrates, that they weren't really interested in getting to the South Pole. I mean, it's not necessarily the case that nobody was, but that the scientists in general weren't interested in the South Pole. What they were interested in was going to Antarctica, mapping it, finding out whether it was a continent, discovering whether there were big mountain ranges there, looking at the zoology, that kind of stuff. And Robert Falcon Scott was tapped as a young naval officer to lead this exp expedition in this ship, the Discovery, 1903, to go back to that area I had just pointed out, um, Ross Island area, and do some geology and other work to try to forward uh, the understanding of whether there was a continent there and, and what was there. So Scott, Scott's attitude to this, by the way, was not, great, my life ambition, I'm finally going to get to Ant go to Antarctica. On the contrary, none of that at all. Scott was a young, poor officer in time of peace desperately wanting preferment, knowing that it was very, very difficult to get any kind of advancement in the Navy because it was an old boys' network and because there, was, there wasn't much advancement because it was a time of peace and so on and so forth. And he had uh, a large-ish family that he was solely financially responsible for. He had no money at all. He desperately wanted a job. So when someone came along and said, hmm, you're a bright young guy. Why don't we put you in charge of this expedition to Antarctica? He said, okay, it's a job, good. Yeah, that was it. <coughs> But Scott was very interested in science. Although he was a naval officer who had left school at 13 in order to, uh, in order to, to pursue his, uh, he'd left school at 13 in order to pursue his naval career, he um, showed a very bright and incisive interest in many areas of science. And so for that reason, if no other, was a good leader to have on this expedition. Well, there's that map again. After the 1908 expedition, 
um, sorry, the 1903 expedition and a further 1908 expedition by Scott's great friend and rival Shackleton, the map looked a bit more like that. Because on Scott's 1903 expedition, they had investigated this area in the Ross Sea around here and the Western Mountains a little bit along here. And then in the 1908 expedition, Shackleton really made the first attempt to get to the pole and succeeded in getting within, I think it was uh, 300 miles or something. No, actually that expedition, it may have been less than that, maybe nearer 100 miles of the pole, but they had to turn back. So this, this part got explored and mapped. But you're still, that's still where you are. Well, today, of course, because of many, many expeditions plus NASA, <laughs> we're a little further on and we have a rather clearer picture of Antarctica. This is that area I was just pointing out and the sort of whiter patch within the red, red circle, if you can see that, I'll show you a map of this later, is Ross Island, um, which became their base. The reason Ross Island was a base is very simple. If you want to get anywhere into the interior of the continent and particularly to the South Pole, the closest point to the South Pole that you can get to by ship is right there. And so Ross Island right here was a, was a good base. And that's what they, they used. Um, why were they going there on this second expedition? A man I will introduce you to in a little minute um, who became the chief scientific officer on the 1911 expedition, the expedition where Scott actually got to the South Pole, which is mainly what I'm going to talk about, um, was a remarkable scientist and artist, and he was tapped by Scott not just to be the chief scientific officer, but also, hey, while you're at it, Sunday afternoon, can you do us a logo? <laughs> and this is the logo that um, Bill Wilson, is his name, uh, drew, and it's very significant because Bill Wilson drew a logo for this expedition that was supposed to plant the Union Jack at the South Pole. That's what all the publicity was about. And what do you got? If you look closely here, this is actually the world upside down, and you can see the tip of South America right here. And this is Antarctica, and that's the South Pole, and sitting rather rudely right on the South Pole is an emperor penguin. This is highly significant uh, for reasons I'll come back to in just a minute. But anyway, that's the, that's the logo. Scott had very, very little money for this expedition. It's funny, Britain in 19, this photograph was taken in late 1910. Britain in 1910 was by far, by far, by far the richest country in the world. And yet, and Scott had already done this successful ex ex exhibition in 1903, despite all that, he had a very hard time raising money to go down to Antarctica again. And he was running around talking to government people, business people, and so on. You know, write me a check, write me a check, what all expedition leaders have to do. He really didn't come up with anything like enough money. And the discovery, that first ship, which was a very good purpose-built Antarctic kind of ship, was no longer available. So Scott bought this ship, which is an old whaler, the Terra Nova. It was already out of date, coal-fired old boiler that had been sort of tacked on. Uh, when he bought it. He bought it, got volunteer labor to clean it out. The whole thing reeked of whale oil and wasn't really very suitable and leaked and so on, but it was what he could get. So this is the ship, and it's leaving on this day in late 1910 from, whoops, um, from Cardiff in South Wales. And the reason it's leaving, this was the last port of call before they left for South Africa, followed by Australia, followed by New Zealand, followed by Antarctica. This is the last port of call in the UK for the simple reason that the mayor of Cardiff, Cardiff, Wales, big coal producing region was then, the mayor of Cardiff had, offered him, had, had promised him 100 tons of free coal. And that's not the sort of offer that you can decline when you're leading an expedition with a coal fired ship. So they went to Cardiff, they got their 100 tons of free coal, and here they are leaving, steaming away towards initially South Africa and then on down. And this is a picture, I'm going to introduce you to two uh, remarkable Antarctic artists this morning. One of them uh, is Edward Wilson, who drew that penguin, and I'm going to show you some more of his work, rather more elaborate work later. But the other one is the ship's photographer, the expedition photographer, a man called Herbert Ponting. And this is one of his many, many photographs taken on deck. The Terra Nova leaked really badly and they also had very bad weather. And back in 1910, 1911, there wasn't a big red button that you could push, which would make the pumps turn on, which would pump out the bilges. Instead, you had this iron bar, whoops, 
sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button here. He had this iron bar connected to another iron bar, which was connected to kind of leather contraption. And the leather contraption was the pump. And during some parts of the voyage, they had five or six men on this iron bar working 10 hours a day, just doing this in teams, in shifts, to pump the water out of the, out of the bilges. And this was just a job that they did all the time. They complained about it a lot, although reading their diaries makes me think, in fact, it was really good because by the time they got to Antarctica, they must have had absolutely enormous chest and shoulder muscles because they'd spent hours and hours over months doing this. Not an entirely bad thing. So that's one of Ponting's photographs. Uh, this, is, this is Ponting himself, and this is a remarkable photograph, obviously not taken by him, but taken by one of the other crew members with his camera. Here he is. And this is his cinematograph, uh, which... Mm -hmm translates loosely into cine camera, or for anybody under about 30, video camera. And he's videoing a storm. And it's a remarkable photograph for two reasons. One is that even in calm weather, Ponting recorded in his diary that he got terribly seasick. He wasn't a seaman at all. He hated being on a boat, was terribly seasick in calm weather. This is the middle of a storm in the, south, in, in, in the um, southern ocean south of New Zealand. And this is an absolutely enormous wave right behind the ship. I mean, this is quite remarkable. This must have been a huge, huge wave to, to, to get that angle. And there's Ponting <coughs> trying to do his stuff. And here he is uh, a little bit later as they try to get through the pack ice on their way to Antarctica. Uh, expeditions to both Antarctica and the Arctic have this, tend to get this, this, this situation where you, you get into a, a band of pack ice and you have to get through the pack ice and then there's clearer water beyond that and there's a whole issue about ha timing things so that you get through at the right time. Anyway, this is the Terra Nova trying to find its way through the pack and here's Ponting extremely precariously perched with his cinematograph trying to get video footage of the, the ship going through the ice and he would, he would go to great lengths to... Uh, to get photographs in good situations, and I'll read you a tiny bit from the book in a minute to illustrate that. However, as um, was it Walt Whitman said, the best laid... No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't thinking of something else. It was um, Robbie Burns said, the best laid plans of mice and men, <laughs> they often gang a glay. Well, Scott's best laid plans were something like this. I have very good reason to believe that I and my crew will be the only human beings in Antarctica this season. That was a reasonable assumption at the time. Yeah, we've got to do this poll thing, because if we don't do this poll thing, we won't be able to raise any money. It's all about glory for Britain and everything. But to be honest, that's not what's interesting. What's interesting is we've got a continent to explore, the last unexplored continent. I want to take a scientific expedition down there. I want to find the best scientists I can, and I want to do geology, zoology, meteorology, uh, bathymetry, that's the studying the seabed, um, study the, the, the Earth's magnetic field and all that stuff. That's what I want to do. And he had essentially not one expedition in that ship, but really about six or seven expeditions packed into the one ship. And he had these very complicated plans for all the different things that they were going to do aside from go to the pole. And then, on his way down, actually I think it arrived in, if I remember correctly, in South Africa, he got a telegram from the great Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen, saying, and I quote, beg to inform you, going south. Now, there's a rather funny story behind this. Amundsen had been planning for some time to try to become the first person to get to the North Pole. He had a ship ready, he had a crew ready, he was doing his final preparations. And then the news came in that the American Peary had got there and done it. And Amundsen wasn't that interested as an explorer in being second. He sailed his ship out of Norway into the open sea and then got his crew up on deck and said, change of plans. We're going to go to the South Pole instead. <laughs> and anybody wants to get off, fine. <laughs> Funnily enough, nobody did. So suddenly, this is the point at which suddenly the, the idea becomes, which has come down to us, this is a race to the pole between these two great explorers. It's very interesting to read Scott's diaries about this. Um, and this is one of the things that makes me admire Scott. Scott, as I intimated, is a very complicated character. Good and, th good and bad things about him that are very hard to weigh up and assess. But one of the things that always made me admire him was what he said in his diary about this. In, in the privacy of his diary, he said, 
I will under no circumstances be provoked into any public reaction to this. And we will proceed with our program precisely as, as if nothing had happened. And at other points in his diary and what he said to his crew, it was very clear that he respected Amundsen enormously. Knew him, he respected him, he knew he was very, very good. He also knew that Amundsen's goal was not to do all the scientific stuff, but was just to get down there, get to the pole and get back again. And clearly Scott thought, yeah, okay, if, if that's what Amundsen wants to do, the chances of us beating him are not great. Uh, but we're just gonna carry on as if nothing had happened. So that's kind of background to, to some stuff that happened later. They get to Antarctica uh, in, uh, in, in July 1911, uh, and, uh, sorry, in, in, in January 1911, and this is them uh, unpacking their prefabricated hut, which they had built in New Zealand, and then tore them down again and then put back up again. This is on Ross Island, that place that I showed you, and you can just, it's very unclear, this is one of Ponting's photographs, but you can just see in the background, that's Mount Erebus, right there, um, looming on Ross Island above, um, above their base, and it's the one of the, I think it's the second or third highest peak in Antarctica, it's not quite the highest, but anyway, it's a, it's a very big mountain, and this is them with all their stores, and this is one of the sledges that they used, big wooden sledge that they used for their expeditions, and that's them getting ready. Um, Ponting liked to take pictures of everything, and he, he actually destroyed many, many of his photographs because he was a real perfectionist, and whenever anything didn't come up to technical scratch, he would, apparently one of the people in their diary said, we would hear him in his little dark room smashing plates. And that was Ponting going through what he'd done and going, that's not good enough smash, that's not good enough smash. But anyway, he still produced a vast number that survive. And this is um, uh, a man called um, Clissold, um, Thomas Clissold, who was the cook making endless pies in the kitchen in that hut that I just showed you. And this is uh, one of their many huskies, um, Osman. And in the book, I've got this picture in the book, and the caption to the picture in the book is Mighty Osman, who came back from the dead. And if you want to know that story, you're just going to have to buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and here's Ponting himself, obviously taken with his camera, but by someone else on the ice, looking very much the explorer. Uh, with his, uh, his big gloves and his cinematograph. Ponting had been all over, all over the world. Ponting had done extensive ex um, expeditions in Africa, China, India, Japan, all over the place. And this was his, I think, first time in the Antarctic. And he was incredibly keen to be there and did just remarkable work, uh, including a series of wonderful portraits of the crew Portraiture was one of the things he was very, very good at. I stole one of, there was a series that I stole one of for my, this is the, the, co the cover of my ebook, the ebook version of my book, uh, which you can, you can get online. Um, and that's one of those portraits there. And I'll show you a couple more of them because they're really quite wonderful. This is, um, this is not one of that series, but this is a famous figure on the expedition, Lawrence Oates, known as Titus, Titus Oates, who famously walked out of Scott's tent and to his own death deliberately because he knew he was slowing them down. And that's a, a little story within a story that I tell in the book uh, with a little twist that I think is not generally known. So that's another good thing for you to get to. But then, so they get down to Antarctica in the fall, in the Antarctic fall, um, the idea being you can't get down there in the spring because by the time you get down there in the spring and you do all the preparation and stuff and try to go to the pole, you're going to not get back in time. So it makes more sense logistically to get down there in the fall, set up your base, sit out the winter already there, and then quickly in the spring get to the pole and back as quickly as you can in the, in the narrow window of halfway tolerable weather. So during the fall, right after they built the hut, they spent a lot of time doing expeditions out onto the ice, hundreds of miles out onto the ice, to lay supply depots. So that when the main expedition got to the pole and was on its way back, they would have these supply depots already in place. So they'd have food and fuel and stuff. So weeks and weeks of sledging that were not directly the polar journey at all, but just to, just to lay supplies. They did this three-week trip, and Ponting did a series of photographs afterwards. And this is the Canadian physicist Silas Wright just after coming back from two weeks of, of hard sledging and uh, showing the results. And there's another one that I like even more. Uh, this is an um, uh, Irish sailor called Patrick Cahan. 
who I think is a character you would not want to disagree with. <laughs> he looks sort of grim, but it's a beautiful photograph. Okay, this is one of, one of Ponting's most famous photographs of all. Uh, that's the Terra Nova in the background at the, at, at, on the sea ice. So they couldn't get right up to the land. So there's, there's a sea ice coming out about a mile out from the land. They anchor the boat on the sea ice and then have to move all their supplies across the sea ice to the land. And, and that's where it is. And then a, about a mile further in, there was, this, there was this iceberg with a grotto in it, ice grotto, as Ponting called it. And so Ponting posed... Um, Griffith Taylor, the Australian geologist, and Silas Wright, who you just saw, the, the Canadian physicist, in this thing, and then got inside and took the photograph with Terra Nova in the background. Very famous, um, one of the first great bits of our Antarctic landscape photography. And I have to just read you a little bit here. How am I doing for time? Okay. This is just a, because there's a wonderful little incident um, that occurred just hours before this photograph was taken. So this was um, January the, I've got the date in here somewhere, January the 5th, I think. Yes, January the 5th. So just a day or two after their arrival in Antarctica, they're doing their initial exploring. In the afternoon of that day, uh, Ponting went out and took this photograph. In the morning, he'd been trying to take phot photographs right near the ship, back over here. And here's a description of what happened. Herbert Ponko Ponting was the expedition photographer. On the 5th of January, the day after our arrival, he was already hard about his business. He had decided to investigate some icebergs that were frozen into the sea about a mile away, that's this, and had just finished piling gear onto his personal photography sledge. The rest of us were still busy unloading the Terra Nova when a group of eight killer whales, what we, say, what we call orcas, came cruising along the ice foot near the ship. Ponko was on the point of setting off for the iceberg, when Scott bellowed to him, Ponting, he cried, Ponting, old man, killer whales, get over here at the double and do your magic. Ponko grabbed some things off the sledge and came loping across the ice, his breath flowing behind him like a grey silk scarf. When he got a little closer, I could see that he had a wooden tripod jammed under one arm and was cradling his great boxy camera in both of his fur-mittened hands. He managed to get to the scene without a mishap, but by then the glistening beasts had disappeared. Undeterred, he took up his position a few feet from the edge at a point near where, the two, do where two dogs were tethered. So the dogs were tethered on the ice next to the ship. It was a beautiful day, a sapphire sky wrapped like a jewel in the most diaphanous white tissue of cirrus. Besides, you just don't get thunder in Antarctica, so the first great boom when it came was puzzling. Even more puzzling was the fact that the dogs went into a snapping, leaping frenzy and Ponko suddenly staggered backwards, doubled over as if he had been punched by an unseen fist. With the second boom, a crack appeared in the ice near Ponko's feet, but it was only after the third that we understood. This was the thunder of the Ross Sea. This was a group of killer whales with fresh dog on the menu. They had disappeared in order to prepare for a coordinated attack, and now they were using their huge seven-ton bodies to bomb the underside of the ice. It was a yard thick. It shattered like a china tea plate. As the pieces of ice began to drift apart, eight black heads loomed up above the surface. They did not look like the heads of living animals. They looked like the tar-black prows of pirate ships, sunk long ago, but eerily returning to the world above the water, eager to claim new victims. Plunko escaped by this much. Uh, so that's kind of... Life down there was dangerous even before they started trying to get to the pole. Okay, so back to this map of Antarctica. We've got Ross Island here. Here's where they are. Here's where all those incidents happened. Uh, and the idea is you're going to get onto the barrier, what we now know as the Ross Ice Shelf. We call it the Ross Ice Shelf, um, which is a floating permanent, unlike the sort of seasonal sea ice, which might be a yard thick. This is permanent floating shelf of ice that's up to 200 feet thick. And... The idea, and this is just to give you an idea of scale, this, this bit, the barrier, is about the size of France. About the size of France. Uh, and the idea is, if you can see, this is hard to see, but right here there's a little black mark that looks like a fingernail mark, right there. That's the Beardmore Glacier, which at this time was believed to be the largest glacier on Earth. It's not, but it's pretty close. It's about 125 miles long and 40 miles wide. And it goes from the barrier at sea level up to 
the polar cap, which is at, at its highest 10,000 feet, probably where the, barrier, where the Beardmore comes out, more like 8,500, 9,000 feet. So the idea was, I think I've got this on here, yeah, to follow this path to the South Pole and then back again. And to give you some idea of that, that's 920 statute or road miles. So it's a bit like dragging a sledge from Seattle to Salt Lake City and back again. Although with higher mountains in the middle and the hotels aren't quite as good. <laughs> uh, an absolutely enormous undertaking, but they knew from the earlier expedition, from the 1908 expedition, that, that they'd gone up the Beardmore and they knew that the Beardmore was passable. It wasn't easy, but it was passable. You could do this and then in theory you could come back. So that was the plan. Okay, so back to Edward Wilson, known to everyone on the expedition as Uncle Bill. In 1903, Wilson was the ship's doctor on the Discovery expedition, and Scott had come to know him as a really remarkable individual, somebody who was uh, endlessly cheerful, fun, good to be around, um, very knowledgeable, um, indispensable in a crisis, somebody with enormous physical stamina, and, and so on. And in fact, Scott described him as the finest man who ever stepped and he went to Wilson and said, look, this was in 1908, he went to Wilson and said, look, I'm thinking of going south again. I've got this other expedition in the works. I want you to be my chief scientific officer. And Wilson said, yeah, on one condition. And Scott said, why? He said, well, if I'm going to go with you to the South Pole, I want, when I'm in Antarctica, to go back and revisit the penguins. Remember the penguin that was sitting on top of the South Pole? Wilson had been, in 1903, one of the first three or four human beings ever to see a live emperor penguin. They'd been, they were, we knew they existed because they'd been found dead, washed up dead in other places. But um, he and some other people found a rookery where they bred on Ross Island, the other end of Ross Island from the camp. And Wilson wanted to go back there and investigate them. And he had some very specific reasons for wanting to do this, which had to do with evolutionary theory. Uh, and... Before I get to that point, let me just show you some of this, this scientist's remarkable art. Uh, this is um, from 1903, the 1903 expedition. This is a drawing he did of camping in a blizzard. This is a painting. Of, this is a black and white production of a, of a color painting, but it's, it's a very subdued color uh, painting of uh, the area around where their camp was. Uh, this is a painting of uh, a parhelion, a, a fog light effect that he was very interested in. And it, this interesting point here is that these were, these were done in color, but of course, if he went out onto the ice and tried to paint with um, either oils or watercolors on the ice, the paint all froze solid, you couldn't do it. So Wilson developed this system for drawing, doing pencil drawings out on the ice with, if you look at his papers, the, this is elaborate system he had and all the, 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 the drawings are covered with little notations like LP fad er blur or something like that. And what that means is light purple fading to blue. And he would then go back to the ship, to the nice warmth of the ship and produce these these paintings, which are very beautiful and very colorful, capturing the light of Antarctica, and some of them a little more, more lurid like that. This is, in fact, um, another character we're going to meet, uh, Birdie Bowers, uh, who was a great friend of what really Wilson's closest friend, checking one of the three meteorological stations they had. They, they put up around the camp three meteorological stations that they called Archibald, Bertie, and Clarence, and they checked them every day, the temperature and stuff, and this is, this is Birdie checking the temperature and so on. Uh, and this is a very characteristic Wilson painting, also, again, of Hut Point near where they had their camp. One of literally hundreds and hundreds of paintings, thousands of drawings that he did. He even did things like this. This was a menu. They had a midwinter day menu. Midwinter day is the sort of thing that traditionally is always celebrated in Antarctica. And they had this midwinter day menu, and he even did a little menu with a drawing of Mount Erebus and the hut and everything. All the people signed it. I'm going to read this out to you. I don't know if you can read it. They had... Consomme, veal, roast beef, and Yorkshire pudding, horseradish sauce, potatoes a la mode, and Brussels sprouts, plum pudding, mince pies, caviar, Antarctic, crystallized fruits, chocolate bonbons, butter, bo and so on and so on. They're pretty good. They did not eat like this every day. <laughs> but anyway, that was midwinter dinner, and that's Wilson drawing the, the menu. And th this is one of his most remarkable drawings. It's characteristic, but it's also remarkable. 
Anybody tell, tell me exactly what this is? Good. It's a leopard seal chasing its lunch, uh, uh, an emperor penguin. And this is an astonishing drawing because on account of the fact that there are guys with very, very heavy dry suits and, and an imp who are impervious to cold who go down with cameras and actually video underwater in Antarctica now, we've all seen stuff like this. And probably most of you have seen footage of underwater life in Antarctica and you certainly can go and see exactly this, leopard seals chasing their favorite food, penguins. But Wilson drew this in 19, I think this, this drawing is from 1903. And it's just astonishing that he had such an eye that he could not only draw these creatures quite anatomically correctly, but get this wonderfully vivid, extraordinarily powerful sense of what they were like in their own environment, even though he hadn't directly ever seen, nobody had directly seen this environment. So I think it's a particularly remarkable drawing. Okay, so Wilson has seen these penguins in 1903, and he's really wrapped up in this theory of the German biologist Ernst Haeckel who had just come out with the idea, completely novel at the time, that birds were basically dinosaurs. If you look at the anatomy, it's very obvious there's some connection there. And Heckel said, hmm, yeah, not only are birds probably dinosaurs, we found Archaeopteryx, which looks like a feathered dinosaur, basically. But Heckel had this additional theory that if you could understand the evolution of the embryological stages of a creature, the embryology of a creature would give you clues to its actual evolutionary history. The idea was that, the two, that one mimics the other. And in fact, if you look at a human embryo at certain points in its development, it looks like the embryo has gill slits. And so the idea was, oh, yeah, well, we were fish once, right? So therefore, da da da. So that was the theory. And at the time, they thought, turned out to be wrong, but at the time, they thought that in evolutionary terms, the penguin was the most primitive bird. So. Wilson said, huh, okay, if we could really study the embryology of the emperor penguin, it would tell us all this stuff about bird evolution. Ah, but as we all now know, there's one problem, which is the emperor penguin has this very annoying habit, which is it sits on its eggs, incubates its eggs during the Antarctic winter. So if you want to look at emperor chicks, which are tremendously cute, go in the spring. But if you want the eggs, you've got to go in the winter. And of course, the Antarctic winter is bad news. Here is a, an illustration, by the way, of Ponting's work, a picture, a portrait of an emperor penguin right next to Wilson's work, a drawing of an emperor penguin. And Wilson, Wilson's comment to Scott, yes, I'll come to Antarctica unless, in, if you let me go to see the penguins again, involved Scott allowing him to do a, a, a midwinter expedition. So, that, so they've come down to Antarctica in the fall. They're going to wait out the winter in their hut, mending equipment and making plans. And then as soon as the spring starts, they're going to head for the pole. Wilson says, OK, look, we're sitting around in this hut for four months in the freezing dark. Why can't I go do my expedition? And Scott said, OK. You take two men. You can take yourself and two men, and you can go on this expedition. I don't want you to do it, because it's crazy, and you'll probably die. But I know you want to do it, and I understand why. And yes, OK, so you can do it. So this was going to involve, by comparison to the polar journey, a tiny journey. Not this, but just from this end of Ross Island to the other end of Ross Island, across the barrier, and back again. Easy, right? This is a drawing in the light taken in, whoops, sorry, done in, in, in 1903 at this place that Wilson and some other people found of those penguins with their chicks. And Wilson having seen this, okay, penguins, chicks, we need to be at this place three months earlier, right? Because then we'll be able to get the eggs, study them. So, says Scott, take two other people. You can take the two best men, the two, the, whatever two men from the expedition you want. And the two men that Wilson chose were this man, a um, uh, Scottish sailor named um, uh, Henry Bowers, known to everyone as Birdie. He had an enormous hooked nose. And he, people said he looked like a parrot, and so he got the, the nickname Birdie. And he was a remarkable individual and an obvious choice because he was a good navigator. He was immensely strong. Uh, he had this reputation for being sort of indestructible and being impervious to cold. Obvious choice. Less obvious choice, the English aristocrat, absolutely Cherry Garrard, 
who comes across, if you read about his early life particularly, as a bit of a sort of Bertie Wooster figure, somebody with, 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 with plenty of money and plenty of privilege and all the right intentions, but not much of a clue about anything. And it's not even clear why Scott accepted him on the expedition. Cherry desperately wanted to go, mainly because he was bored and wanted to get out of his boring, privileged life. But why Scott agreed to take him is not clear, although, in fact, as it turned out, he became one of the most valuable members of the expedition. Anyway, so these three guys. <laughs> this picture is taken at 11 o'clock in the morning on July the 27th, I think it was, uh, 1911. And of course, it's pitch dark because it's the Antarctic winter. And these guys are about to set off on this bird hunt, egg hunting expedition across Ross Island. And here they are, just ready to go with their uh, sledge in the background. And the core of my book, which I'm not going to go on about in detail, but the core of my book is this journey and what it means for our understanding of the expedition as a whole. Uh, the journey was, in a way, a disaster. Uh, just about everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. And the, the three men survived, at least survived this bit of the journey, uh, was a series of miracles, really. And uh, they look pretty happy about setting off there. But what they had to do was uh, go from, this is so, um, the South Pole is up here somewhere way up here. And this is Ross Island. Uh, there you go. And so what they had to do is go from Hut Point, where the hut is, across the sea ice here, which is the winter, so there's hard sea ice, which would disappear in the summer, but it's there at the, at this, this time, um, up onto the barrier. So there's a kind of a lip there. And then across to this um, penguin breeding area, spend maybe a week there or something, do some studying, come back again. So they were thinking maybe 10 days, maybe 12 days for the whole thing. They were away for, I think it was 35 days. And uh, that they got back at all, given what happened, is quite remarkable. On the very first day, they got to about here from the hut and then camped. On the second day, they came around this, hut, this point here, Castle, Castle Rock Hut Point, and climbed up onto the edge of the barrier which in a modern photograph looks sort of like this. So you'd reach this barrier and you'd have to get your sledge. You'd find some spot where there's some fallen blocks of ice here and get ropes and manage to get it up here. And after that, it's pretty flat, but this is pretty difficult. When they were doing this, Cherry was up at the top trying to haul on a rope with this 500 pounds. No, actually, the two sledges were 700 pounds, so they were about 300 and something pounds each, trying to get this sledge up. The other two were behind. The rope started slipping, so he took his mitten off to try to get a better grip. He had other gloves on. He had smaller gloves on underneath, but still, um, here's what happens. I hope none of you have just eaten very recently uh, when you get frostbite. This actually was, is not a picture of Cherry's hand because, Cherry, because they didn't have a camera with them on this side expedition, but... but by ironic coincidence, almost exactly the same thing happened to one of the other men, a guy called Atkinson, who was one of the scientists back at base, who got caught in a blizzard very close to the hut and got lost in the blizzard and was out for about six hours without being found. When he came back in, Ponting took a picture of his hand. And that's pretty much what happened to Cherry Garrett's hand. And it was like that for most of the rest of the expedition, the, the side expedition. Uh, neither of them lost any fingers, but it was close. So Wilson is still drawing like mad the whole time. Uh, this is a drawing of sort of trying to imagine them in their little huddled in their tent on the barrier. Um, this is his rather fantastical picture in a way of sort of pic picturing perhaps not so much what it looked like as what it felt like, the three of them proceeding through this blizzard uh, in, the middle of the, in the middle of the dark. With a, this would have been, by the way, Wilson holding a candle. Uh, they, he, he had this candle thing made out of an old biscuit tin, and they would... They would follow this candle, and it's quite a lot of the time it was very, very still, which sounds good, but actually, as I explained in the book, that makes it worse, because it gets colder the stiller it is, and they, they, they could navigate using this candle. Uh, and that's a, a drawing from his diary of the stone hut they built. When they finally got to the penguin rookery, they had a tent, and then they thought, well, let's build something more permanent, so they built this kind of stone hut, uh, which, for reasons I go into in the book, really didn't work out well at all. Um, and they kept fall falling down crevasses. And this is a picture, that, a, a drawing that Wilson did of them falling, one of them falling down a crevasse and the other one trying to rescue. And there's a sledge just hanging on the lip of the crevasse like this. And that happened pretty routinely. 
when they finally got back from the side expedition, uh, they, having repeatedly nearly died for various reasons, I think you can see a certain amount of difference. Here they are looking very perky, getting off. And this, this was taken about an hour after they got back. By the time they got back, all the rest of the, the, the expedition assumed they were dead, basically. They thought, well, they could still show up, but they're probably dead uh, because they were way late and they'd already run out of food, they'd run out of fuel. Uh, and you can still see in this picture that Cherry Garrett's hand is still very badly swollen. Uh, and there they are. So that's the kind of... The, the fact that Wilson really didn't care about going to the pole, even though he ended up going there, uh, but cared deeply about being able to do this bit of scientific experimentation that unfortunately required a suicidal trip to, to get the evidence he needed, uh, says a great deal. And the fact that Scott let him do it says a great deal about what Scott's real motivation was. He wanted to see real science done, and, and Wilson was the guy who was most energetic about doing it. And these are the three eggs that I refer to in the book as the three most inconvenient eggs in the history of ornithology. Because so many things went wrong with the, exped the side expedition that they only managed to collect three eggs. And in fact, by the time they collected them in the process of basically fighting for their lives, all three of them froze solid. And because they froze solid, that meant that they weren't really anything like as useful. And for various other reasons, they turned out to be not as useful as they had hoped. But anyway, those are the, those are the three eggs they tried to collect. After that, back at the hut, and then they start that long, long polar expedition, which is the famous story that ends, as most people know, with disaster from their point of view. They finally, finally get to the pole, only to discover a Norwegian flag flying above um, Amazon's tent, which he had left there. Amazon had arrived about a month before them, and not only had arrived a month before them, but then got back, sorry, had got back with essentially no trouble. Um, Amazon described getting back from the pole as basically a long walk in the sunshine. And of course he had dogs and Scott's had a lot of criticism about why didn't you take more dogs and stuff and I can go into that if anybody wants. There are some interesting issues there. Uh, but anyway, Amazon got back really with basically no trouble. Scott was a month later and there's a lot of evidence that not only was it a month later in the, even, in, in the season, but that he was uniquely unlucky and that they had freakishly early, very, very cold winter Antarctic weather. The result was they got back, um, I don't know if I can flip, no, I'm not gonna try it, but um, if you think of that Antarctic map again, they got right back across the polar plateau, they got back down the Beardmore Glacier, they got about halfway back across the barrier which on the map makes it look like they were almost home. Uh, in fact, it was a good two weeks of brutally hard sledging, even if the men had been fit, and by that time they were not. Uh, and they, Scott and his four companions died in their tents. Uh, this is the five of them at the pole, and I think you can tell from the expressions, even at the pole, that things are not going well. This is Titus Oates, who I showed you that portrait of before ex-army officer, he had a very bad leg wound in South Africa about five years before this, and he probably had the very beginnings of scurvy because the leg wound had opened up again, and that tends to happen. You have a very old wound that looks like it's completely healed. You get scurvy, suddenly the old wound he opens up again. This had happened. Um, he, uh, he, his leg wound had opened up. He also already had bad frostbite. Scott already had bad frostbite. Uh, Taff Evans, this seaman who was generally considered, and you can kind of see this in the photograph, the biggest and strongest guy on the entire expedition, but he had cut his hand while trying to mend a sledge about two weeks earlier. And it's believed, this is all speculation, but it's believed that by this time he had blood poisoning. And he died very soon after this picture was taken. This is uh, Cherry Garrard's two companions, Wilson again, and Bertie Bowers, who were the other two men on the polar team. And one of the most moving things for me in researching this book was I wrote the whole thing, as you've got from that, in, that, that extract, I wrote the whole thing from Cherry Garrett's point of view. So it sort of reads a bit like a novel, even though it's a true story. Because Cherry Garrett was so invested in, in, in these two men as his sort of heroes and friends, and, uh, and he communicated with all the time, and he had left them two notes. He was one, on one of these expeditions where they, sorry, on one of these trips where they left supply depots, right? So Cherry was on one of those, not on the polar expedition. And he left, they, they had a system where you'd have a 12 foot tall bamboo pole with a little uh, tin can on the top and you'd leave messages in the tin can. 
no texting in those days. The, the nearest thing they had to texting was the 12-foot bamboo pole at a supply depot, and you'd leave notes to people. So Cherry leaves these two notes, um, two, uh, Wilson, one to Wilson and, and one to Bowers, saying, you should, be, you should be at the pole by now. You should be on your way back. We're looking forward so much to seeing you when you get back to camp. Best of luck, yours, Cherry, or something like that on these tiny scraps of paper in pencil. When these men died, and a year later, Cherry was one of the people on the expedition to go find their bodies, and was one of the people who found their bodies. Because he was one of Wilson's best friends, Scott let him kind of look over Wilson's body and find his effects. And in Wilson's breast pocket, he found various things, including a prayer book, a letter to his wife, and these two notes. When I was in Cambridge at the Scott Polar Research Institute doing research for this book, the librarian was bringing me various items I'd asked for, and I opened this manila folder and found those two notes. <laughs> I found myself holding those two same pieces of paper, fragile as tissue paper. Uh, so it's remarkable. This is, a, of course, a, a detail of Bertie Bowers, and you can see Bertie was famous for this very odd hat he wore. Uh, and you can see that he's taking the photograph with a piece of string. There's a ball of string right there, and of course no time delays or anything in those days, but he's taking the photograph by yanking on this piece of string. So, all those five men died, and when They'd found their bodies a year later, and they couldn't bring the bodies back. They buried the bodies in place and put a cross made of skis on. In fact, one of the skiers used his skis to make a cross over the can they made, sort of over the tent. And then they found Scott's skis, and that guy who used his skis for the cross skied back to base on Scott's skis so that Scott's skis would kind of have come back. And they built this cross, which still stands on Ross Island to this day, uh, and with the names, and uh, the inscription was written by Cherry Garrett. Various people said, well, what should we put up there? We should have a Bible verse or something. And Cherry Garrett said, no, I've got a better idea. And so what it says is, in memoriam, Dr. Edward A. Wilson, Captain Scott, Captain Oates, Petty Officer Evans, Lieutenant Bowers, who died on their return from the pole, March 1912. And then the inscription is the last lines from Tennyson's famous poem, Ulysses, to strive to seek to find and not to yield. And that was his memorial to them, still there. Scott's reputation after this was driven by two things. It was driven by the fact that he had done this remarkable exploration, even though failing to be the person who was going to put the Union Jack there first because Amazon beat him to it. Uh, and by the fact, which is, is really remarkable, that in dying with his men, he wrote about, even just the day before he died, he's writing letters frantically to the, to the wives of his men and to his own wife and finishing off his diary and stuff. And these, these diaries are just remarkable documents. Wilson, highly educated man, um, and, a, a, and a very imaginative man in a way, wrote incredibly dull diaries. They're, they're interesting factually, but they're not good reading because they're just facts and facts and facts. Scott, who had left school at 13 and had almost no formal education, was a brilliant writer who was extraordinarily emotionally evocative, and his, his diaries are just fantastically worth writing, and these letters that he wrote at the end, some of which I reproduce in the book, are fantastically worth writing. So he's, he's the hero who, um, who took on Antarctica and became, um, and, and, and in death somehow summarized what the hero's death should be like. And that's kind of the story from my parents' generation. You get to the 1970s and 1980s, um, there's a man called Roland Hunford who wrote a biography of Scott and Amundsen in the 1970s, which very much was trying to sort of slaughter the sacred cow. So, well, actually, why did Scott and his men die? The answer is because Scott was an incompetent idiot. He didn't know what he was doing. He made terrible decisions left, right, and center. He was hated by his men. He was a bad leader. He was this, da 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 da, da. Imagine 200 pages of that. Uh, and his... Reputation went into very, very steep decline. 
At the same time, his old uh, friend and, uh, I'm nearly done, his, his, his friend and later rival, Ernest Shackleton, if you look at the history of Shackleton's reputation, it's fascinating. It does exactly the opposite. Just as Scott's reputation is going into st extraordinarily steep decline in the 70s, 80s, 90s, Shackleton's reputation, which was never very great early on, um, suddenly is going like this. Um, Caroline Alexander's book, excellent book, I have to say, Endurance, which is about his famous endurance exp expedition and various other things. By the late 1990s, you've got major corporations doing seminars on Shackletonian leadership and all this stuff, and Shackleton is just God. Uh, the very strange thing is that in this period, virtually no new facts had ever emerged about either of these men or their careers. None of this is based on new knowledge. All of it is based on just changing perceptions of existing knowledge, which is very, very strange. And I, I found myself thinking, well, which, which of the, should I believe what my parents told me about this man? Should I believe what Hunford and, and other people are telling me about this man? Uh, and you know, which, which Scott is real? Uh, and I, because I'm a writer and I like, sorry, because I'm a writer and I like, um, making lists of words, I started making lists of things that had been said to describe what Scott was really like. It struck me when I started to make this list that Scott is a really good example of a hero in this sense, that he's one of those people, one of those rare human individuals who is so complex that rather like those ancient, rather like Hercules and, and, that, and, and Achilles and that lot, you, you can in a sense make up any story you want about him because he because there's so much in there, because there, there, there is evidence for just about everything on this list if you want to look for it. And, I decided in the end that I didn't really believe my parents' story about him as a sort of action hero, but that I did think of him as a hero for another kind of reason, which is that he really had desperately wanted to bring back real knowledge. He really was a true explorer in the sense that he really wanted to bring back real new knowledge about the world, which in fact was true of Amundsen on some expeditions, but not on this one. On this expedition, Amundsen's only interest was in getting the Poland back and, and planting the flag. And it's very interesting that Scott has been represented again and again and again as a typical example of a sort of jingoistic late Victorian Englishman who wanted some national glory. He was a naval officer, after all, fits the picture right. In fact, there's very little evidence for that, and there's a lot of evidence that Scott's real motivations, that he had to sort of play that part, partly to raise money, but, but, but that really his real motivations were very different. Um, nothing could illustrate this better than the fact, oh, well, two things here. First of all, if, if you want a good book on Scott and the Antarctic, of course you should buy mine and half a dozen copies for all your friends. Uh, but if you want a more detailed, my book is quite short, if you want something meatier and more detailed, a really great biography that is also a very good and fair biography of Scott is this book by David Crane, Scott of the Antarctic. I think this is the best of many, 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 many books that have been written about Scott. The problem with his reputation is illustrated wonderfully by this book, this is one book in fact, by the British explorer Ranulph Fiennes, who has the advantage of having actually been to both poles many, many times and actually dragged a sledge in a blizzard and done all that stuff. So he has a kind of insider's view of Scott. And he published a book called Captain Scott. And then soon after it came out, his publisher said, this just isn't, this just isn't hitting the sweet spot enough. We need a racier title. Let's call it Race to the Pole. <laughs> so, Fines' book became called Race to the Pole, even though the central argument of Fines' book is essentially the same as mine, which is, no, it wasn't a Race to the Pole. <laughs> That's not really what it was about. And yet, he had to see his book published under this title. Um, there's a play by Bertolt Brecht called Galileo, which is an imaginative recreation of Galileo's life, in which one of the characters who's a bit of a sentimental character called Andrea says unhappy the land that has no heroes and Galileo who's a cynic in the play at least retorts no unhappy the land in need of heroes 
And I don't know whether I'm Andrea or Galileo, really. And the more I look at Scott, the, the less sure I am whether it's a good thing to have heroes or not. But Scott provides a very interesting test case of what we should really think of and look for in a hero. So that's partly why I wrote the book. That's the, that's the, uh, the hardcover, whoops, the hardcover of my book. That's my website, and that's the blog I just recently started. And uh, I would love to take questions. That's all I have to say. Thank you very, very much. Thank you to Chris. <laughs> questions?